and the rule of law. So I'm going to ask the master of the rules, Justice Patel, who is um, uh, equivalent to the Chief Justice of India on this panel, whether I can change it to judiciary and breach of rule of law. Uh, because that's really what's happening now. Uh, in order to, uh, to, to really understand what is happening, Colin has gone through this very well, I'd like to flag a couple of cases and then put it across to you as to how, in insidious ways, uh, the entire judicial landscape has changed. Take, for example, the Hardia case. Two people decided to marry. One high court decides to annul their marriage because they didn't find it to their liking. Comes to the Supreme Court and most of us thought it would be an in and out appearance. It turned out to be one of the longest cases that court number one dealt with. Why? Because first they ordered an NIA inquiry no less. They went into the whole issue of whether the woman was capable, an adult woman was capable of giving her consent. They asked whether she should be put under the guardianship of X or Y. All of which was bizarre and completely against what we thought was the rule of law. As it turned out, towards the end, because of massive public criticism, the court decided to do the, uh, do the right thing, allowed the couple to remain married, but the NIA investigation continues. I next come to the discharge of police officers in the two celebrated encounter cases, Isha Jahan and Surabhati, where police officer after police officer has been discharged for want of evidence in cases filed by the CBI. Can't contrast this with the cases against those people who have different political ideologies. In particular, I refer to the case of Professor Sai Baba. Professor Sai Baba, as you know, is 90% disabled. He was a professor at Delhi University. Arguably, he has an ideology which is different from that of the ruling party. A case was registered against him in Aheri in Maharashtra, within the jurisdiction of police station Karcharoni. A case based on whatever was recovered from, the, from his computer. So basically personal letters, letters addressed to other political persons, etc. I had occasion to, uh, to, to analyze it because Professor Dr. Sai Baba had consulted me throughout his trial. There was nothing there which, would, which can be viewed as a threat to the Indian state. Nothing there which comes within the formal definition of sedition or any of the other, other, other charges for which he has been charged. And yet this 90% disabled man was convicted for life. Why does that happen? We have laws in this country that nobody talks about. The Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, UAPA Act, which is the successor to Tara and Bota, which is one of the most draconian laws that any civilized democracy has had the privilege of passing. Under the UAPA Act, and combine it with the NIA Act, basically, if anybody is found, and any one of you who's found sitting in this gathering and making rather brave statements, uh, can be picked up. On very specious grounds, you are a member of an unlawful organization. You are a member of a terrorist group. No proof required, just a bold statement. And if convicted, you're convicted for life. How do you prove that you're not a member of an unlawful organization or that you're not a member of a terrorist, terrorist group? The state is not required to prove anything. The owner shifts to to the poor defendant. How does an accused prove? Now Sai Baba thought that he could present to the court his various medals, his thesis, uh, his testimonials from his students, etc. None of it mattered because the police in Gatchalobi said this particular email that he has sent to person X talks of a revolution and that's enough to prove that he's a member of an unlawful uh, organization. And so he gets convicted, among other sections, under section 15 
uh, and Section 20 of the UAPA Act. I think some of our con conversations must spread to these draconian acts. Why does the NIA Act uh, give the police the power to keep a person in custody without remand up to 180 days? What gives the police the right to not give basic documents of the case to an accused person? If an accused does not have access to documents of the case, how is an accused supposed to defend himself? And that's happening in NIA case after NIA case. You can come to any NIA court in Delhi and you can see this happening. And courts uphold this procedure because national interest is involved. What, what have they violated or what is that particular act that they have violated that justifies keeping them in custody without remand, without bail, without giving them documents of the case? So when we talk of rule of law, what is that rule of law that we are talking about when all I'm seeing is breach of rule of law? I am extremely distressed that our courts have not just not intervened in these cases and have, at least in the case of Sai Baba, refused to grant him bail. Look at the case of Kobar Gandhi. He has a million cases across the country and that's the joke amongst us all. He gets acquitted in one, he gets taken into uh, the jurisdiction of another police station in another state. All of them saying he's a member of an unlawful organization. In the parent case in Delhi, he got acquitted. I conducted his trial. Now, it doesn't matter that the special cells version that Kobar Gandhi was a member of an unlawful assembly was, was, was thrown out by the court. The court rejected it. But Hyderabad, Jharkhand, Surat, uh, Patiala, all of them won Kobar Gandhi's custody on exactly the same charge. Can a man be charged for the same offense in 50 different jurisdictions? The law I learned in law school says no, but apparently I'm outdated in my law because the law that is now being practiced is that he can. And so the man continues to be in, in custody with no hope of coming out anytime soon. These are questions we need to ask. It doesn't matter whether the, their politics is different from your politics or politics. The law has to be consistent and the application of the law has to be consistent. Look at, look at, look at what the, the Apex Court has done. I remember the judgment of Justice Ochin Naparedi in the Jehovah Witness case of 1986, I think it was called Bijoy Emanuel, in which Justice Reddy said in a beautiful judgment that it doesn't matter whether these children who belong to the Jehovah Witness sect do not sing the national anthem because their religious uh, uh, faith tells them not to sing the national anthem. And it was upheld after an elaborate discussion of Australian law, uh, American law, etc. It was upheld. Today, we have a situation where the Chief Justice's Court tells us that we must stand up for the national anthem in cinema halls and everywhere else. So when, in Loya's case, the, the court slams the PIL walas and says, who are these PIL people? The court conveniently forgets that very important PILs were fined deliberately and they entertained those PILs for purposes of sending out some some message like this particular one where they said that you have to stand out to the national anthem. PILs are regularly fine. As Colin said, we are facing an unprecedented crisis in our judiciary where almost half our courts are empty because there are no appointments. What does the Supreme Court do? As recently as two months ago, in a motivated PIL, it has asked all states in the country to have dedicated sessions courts and magisterial courts to try cases against politicians as though that is the most important thing that we have to do and to complete the trials within one, hour, one, one year. What does it do to our system? A system which is overworked, a system which does not have enough judges, what it does is it pulls out from that remaining pool two more judges 
two more judges dedicated to fast track cases against politicians. So your fast track cases for rape cases, your fast track cases under the Prevention of Corruption Act, Delhi has 26 special judges who are dealing with Prevention of Corruption Act cases. What about cases against the human body? What happens to cases of murder and rape, which are, which are pending in our courts for 15 years? Look at that landmark case that took place in Hashimpura in 19, almost 30 years ago where 44 men of a community, the Muslim community, were shot dead by officers in uniform. 30 years the trial went on. It will happen because they are not your priority cases. And what happens at the end of 30 years? Witnesses have forgotten what they have to say. The judge has lost interest. The prosecution has lost its documents. If it hasn't lost it, it will conceal it. And in the end, you tell families who have followed this case for 30 years, sorry, we are acquitting all the accused persons. I am in the appeal in the High Court, and we suddenly noticed that very, very critical documents that, that the prosecution ought to have proven at the time when they presented uh, their evidence, relating to these men in uniform, were concealed by mistake in the electronic evidence that they gave us as part of the CD of the case, we found those documents. We moved an application for additional evidence. Just imagine how bizarre this all sounds. 31 years later, the complainants move an application to record additional evidence because that is the one link evidence which was missing in the case. And now we've gotten hold of that, something which the prosecution had concealed all this while. Because we were before an amazing division bench, they allowed that application, it has gone back to the sessions court, that evidence has been recorded and the, and the documents are being resent to the High Court to hear the appeal. How often does this happen? It's not something that I wish to celebrate because it's happened 31 years too late, but it has happened. So what is, what, is, what are our priorities? What does this judiciary think it's doing at this present point? Because our priorities only seem to be playing to the galleries. If you recall, and I believe he was, he was part of the earlier sessions here, Kanaya was attacked in broad daylight in Patiala House Courts in Delhi, not once but twice. The Supreme Court sent five observers, senior advocates, to try and understand what was happening and to report back to them. Those observers were also attacked. A criminal contempt case was filed, first in Justice Chalameshwar's court, and then it finally came before Justice Gogoi's court. Action should have been taken against those lawyers, but it was not. What does it lead to? A similar incident taking place in Katua, where lawyers understand that no action will be taken against them. There's already precedent. And therefore, they deliberately try and prevent the filing of the charge sheet. They, they prevent the lawyer for the victim from appearing in court. Now, these are, this, if this is not uh, interference in the due administration of justice, what is? What else is? So when courts fail to act, yes, my, the master of the roster has just told me 15 minutes are over, so I'll finish. When courts fail to do their job, incidents repeat themselves. You have the same thing happening again and again and again. I like to end by, I don't know how many lawyers are here, but the one deep disappointment of the last few years has been the way members of my fraternity have behaved. Lawyers are in the forefront of movements where they say they will not appear for X or Y accused. What gives them the right to say that when the Advocates Act, which governs us all, tells us that we cannot refuse a brief just because we don't like the person whom we are representing. But bar councils pass resolutions, bar councils take the most, uh, take the most, uh, have, uh, the most regressive kind of resolutions are passed by them, and lawyers appear suddenly to have forgotten the constitution of this country and behave in the most regressive fashion. That's deeply, deeply, deeply uh, distressing. Because if there are no lawyers, we are the then there will be no robust court. And if there isn't any robust court, then I think the lives 
all of us are in serious danger. So really we're not talking about rule of law, we're actually talking about grave instances of breach of the rule of law. Thank you.